On behalf of the Department of English, I, I want to welcome all of you to this wonderful event. Um, before introducing uh, Patsy Valdez, I want, I want to also thank the Department of English and the Office of the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs for bringing uh, Patsy Valdez to Berkeley as a Regents Lecturer. I also want to thank uh, Jason uh, Trevino for all the hard work that he did in organizing this event, mm -hmm. and Professor uh, Genaro Padilla and Hertha Sweet Wong, uh, who's not here, she'll be here in a minute, um, mm -hmm. for their support. Uh, the title of Ms. Valdez's talk today is ASCO and Beyond. Uh, it will be followed by a conversation with Professor Padilla, and uh, there'll be time for questions from the audience after that conversation, and everything will be followed then by a reception, which we'll have in the department lounge, and it's down the hall. Uh, so everyone's invited, please come to that. Uh, it's a tremendous honor to, to introduce Patsy Valdez. Um, Ms. Valdez received a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in 1985 from the Otis Art Institute of Los Angeles. She also studied at the famous Parsons School of Design in New York. Like so many other artists of her generation, Valdez's artistic career was influenced by her participation in the political movements of the late 1960s and the early 1970s. Valdez launched her artistic career with the Chicano art group ASCO, which is Spanish for nausea. Significantly, she was the only female among the founding four-member group, which included photographer Harry Gamboa and artist Willie Heron and Gronk. ASCO, which operated from 1972 to 1987, expanded the definition of Chicano art beyond murals and posters by experimenting with a range of art forms, including street performance, photographic montage, pageantry, experimental film, and conceptual art. But Valdez's representational critiques of gendered ideologies in glamour and fashion also gave her work, in particular, an edge which was distinctly feminist. After the disbanding of Osco, the multi-talented Valdez continued her work in photography, installations, and graphic arts, as well as theater stage and costume design. But ultimately, it was painting that became her most compelling art form. Valdez's paintings represent the best of Chicana avant-garde expressionism. Many of Valdez's paintings focus on domestic interior spaces, kitchens, living rooms, etc. Her images are saturated with color and convey an overabundance of dreamlike emotions. As Laura Perez writes, quote, a sense of pain in the domestic space irrepressibly bleeds out through rooms awash in blood red and or orange red palette, unexpectedly covering walls, floors, tablecloths, dishes, and utensils. These enigmatic scenes of domestic order and safety gone awry seem to function as a metaphor of the violenced female body and psyche, unquote. In this manner, her art is at once rigorously feminist and intimately personal. Human subjects are scarce in many of her paintings, but the works are nevertheless profoundly humanistic in their representations of loneliness, emotional pain, and, their, and the desire to fill the absence of human contact. Art critic Tere Romo writes that, quote, her home scenes are very much a metaphor for her own interior home and how she feels about herself. She is protecting her sense of home within herself. And it's not always comfortable, unquote. The discomfort one senses in viewing her work can be understood as a critique of social alienation, and yet her paintings continue to be imbued with an implied commitment to civic responsibility. Valdez herself states, quote, my paintings are snippets of environments that I consider meaningful and symbolic of my individual as well as collective Chicano experience, unquote. Valdez has won numerous pre prestigious awards for her work, including a National Endowment for the Arts Award, a grant from the J. Paul Getty Trust Fund for the Visual Arts, the Latina of Excellence Award in the Cultural Arts from the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, the Brody Arts Fellowship in Visual Arts, a Flintridge Fellowship, and a Durfee uh, Durf Foundation grant. Valdez's work has also been featured at the Alma Awards, the Latin Grammys, and in several high-profile collections including the Smithsonian Institution and, a, and public museums nationally and internationally. Her work was also included in the traveling exhibition entitled Chicano Visions, American Painters on the Verge, curated by Cheech Marin, which began touring in 2008. 
Patsy Valdez is one of the most important Chicana artists working in the U.S. today, and her art has found significance not only for other artists, but for scholars of literature, history, ethnic studies, women's studies, and other disciplines as well. So it should come as no surprise that her Berkeley visit is being sponsored by the Department of English. <laughs> uh, it is a tremendous privilege to have Patsy Valdez here. Please join me in giving, giving her a very warm welcome. I'm just honored to be here at Berkeley, and I rehashed over and over what I was going to say, how I was going to present my presentation. I, so I decided, because it's called Oscar and Beyond, I'm not going to talk about my paintings, but I'm, I'll wait till everyone sits. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little history uh, of growing up in East L.A. and what was happening pre in high school and before I started my art practice, which had a huge influence on me as an artist. So I went to, I, I went to high school from 1968 and I graduated in 1970. I went to Garfield High School. And I was in 10th grade when uh, the walkouts were, take, were taking place. And as a young 10th grader, you know, I was really confused about what was going on and the issues uh, that were of relevance at that time. But eventually I caught on and... Um, what happened that was that I personally had encountered racism in high school. And um, I remember I had this homemaking, I had these grand visions even in 10th grade that I was going to be this great artist <laughs> and that I was going to make history. How and where I got that, I'm not quite sure. I just know that that's what I, that was a goal from a very young age. So at that time, there was a class called homemaking. And uh, I remember being in the classroom and the teacher would say, you know, you better pay close attention in this class because one day you're going to be cooking and cleaning for other people. And I remember thinking, oh, really? I would be like horrified. I'm looking at this woman thinking, oh, really? <laughs> Quietly. And I used to think, no, one day I'm going to be a great artist. What are you talking about? But things like that, comments like that are what fueled the fire that was already burning inside of me to prove comments like that wrong and that I was going to really go way beyond those kind of uh, comments. And that's why the first image you saw me sort of innocent, sweet, 10th grader, and then I had to overlap it with this image I had made of barbed wire. But alongside the walkouts, it was the time of flower power and Woodstock. And I was totally into it. I thought I was like a Mexican hippie. That's, everybody would make fun. You know, I'm a 10th grader and my friend and I would wear beads and boot, thigh boots and minis. And uh, the other people in school would sort of make fun of us and go, who do you think you are, a Mexican hippie? And I'd think, yeah, I do think I'm that. So anyway, here I have two conflicting things going on, right? The walkouts on one hand, and then this flower power, you know, love-in kind of stuff. And, of course, it's the drug, sort of the, I don't know if it's a drug generation. I really don't know how to say it properly, but that's why I put those, uh, that little statement up there from the Jefferson Airplane. So I was quite... Uh, a little bit, 
I didn't really listen to Latin music. I really listened to a lot of American rock and roll. That's really what influenced me in my work. So, you know, um, the walkouts are happening and we're fighting for bilingual, bicultural education. We wanted Latino teachers and administrators. We wanted smaller classrooms. And we needed a revision of our textbooks because they were really outmoded. So this was a really important uh, moment. And I'm so proud that, I mean, I'm so happy that I was able to take part in that. So I graduate from high school, I'm sort of skipping, and then we have the moratorium. And that was, uh, we were against the Vietnam War, so we all per march down Whittier Boulevard in East LA heading towards, it was called Laguna Park at the time. And the re so the reason that the Vietnam War is the Vietnam issue was important, really important to me because it hit home. Willie Heron, who's on the left in high school, I remember in twelfth grade, he got his draft papers, and I was thinking, and you know we were very close then, and I remember thinking, oh my God, if this guy, if you get drafted. You're never coming back. You're going to die. I just, he was a very skinny kind of guy, and I thought, you're never going to make it. So fortunately, I have a cousin who was in a rock band, and they had an attorney who was helping them to do learn to not get inducted. So they were instructed how to go about that in a legal manner. So anyway, I talked to the attorney, I, Willie, I turned Willie on to him, and then Willie, thank God, followed through and didn't get inducted. And, so, and then soon after, Gronk, who's on the right side, look at Gronk, I mean, come on, you're going to go into the, into the, into the <laughs> service? So basically, Gronk got when I met Gronk, he was running, dodging the draft. He, I'd say, where's Gronk? They'd go, oh, he pitched a tent in someone's backyard. And it was true. Or he's living on the roof of East LA College. Or he's over here, over there. And I remember we'd give him food because he's always on the run. Well, eventually he did get drafted. And I think he only, I really don't know how long he was in, probably a couple of weeks. But Gronk is very brilliant. And I'm sure he either acted like he was crazy or I don't know what he did, but they, they got rid of him and he was, he was free. So this is an image of the aftermath of the moratorium against the Vietnam War. And I'm sure you probably, most of you already know the story about the march was peaceful, and then an incident happened in a liquor store, which gave the cops the, oppor the opportunity to, I would say, start the riot. They started beating people with clubs and tear gassing, and it was, it was hell. Thank God I wasn't there. I had just gone back to work. And I turned on the radio and then heard about what was going on. And of course, we all know this was just down the street from my house where Ruben Salazar was in the silver dollar and they shot that um, gas. That, um, what do they call Ga the tear gas? grenade or whatever it's called at him, and then he died. This is the way the neighborhood looked 
one of the streets. I was trying to research and look online to find images so I could share them, but this is a again right in my neighborhood and this is what it looked like after the riots. This is this was a really beautiful shopping area on Whittier Boulevard where they had very lovely stores and uh, all the rioting and things happened on this particular street. I really, I, that image that I found, I really just like to look at it. It's, it's a powerful image. Okay, so the riots happen, the walkouts happen, you know, all these things, I'm encountering racism, all these things are happening around me. And then, I, you know, you're, when you're 16, 17, 18, you're also just growing, you're growing up and you're trying to find your way. And you, um, so I would, I, I don't even think I drove then. My mom, we'd be driving in the car and I'd see this guy like sitting on the curb wearing either a long velvet coat with a sequin top and this strange hat and he'd be sitting there sketching and I'm thinking, who is that guy? <laughs> I wanna know who that is. He looks like, you know, he's making art. So when my, sis my younger sister said, oh, I'm in a play, do you wanna go and check it out? And I said, I'd love to. So that was the day I met Gronk, and the play was called Kaka Roaches Have No Friends, which is sort of hilarious. And it was being performed at Belvedere Park. And one thing about Gronk, when I met him, he had this very mesmerizing stare, and he listened intently to whatever you were saying. And uh, at one point, I just want to, you know, go meet him and see what was going on. Before you knew it, I, he said, you want to be in the play? And I'm like, okay, Gronk. I was like hypnotized. <laughs> yes, Gronk. So uh, I said, where are the costumes? And he said, see that pile over there? It was all these torn rags. Or, he said, they're over there. Go make a costume. I'm like, okay. So... Uh, that was my first encounter with Gronk. And then I meet, or the, the group forms, the group Osco starts to form. Uh, the three of us, which is Willie Heron, that I knew in high school, and Harry Gamboa, who I also met in high school, and then Gronk, we would just, we just started hanging out, three friends, having, we'd have dialogue about, you know, the LAPD or the racism we'd encounter, or what was going on in the school. Um, so we were just talking about all these different things. And uh, before you knew it, it became a regular kind of thing we did. We met, I think, almost daily, actually, discussing various issues. So none of us had a studio, and we would meet in either my garage or Willie's garage. And one thing that I think we knew early on is that we had to get noticed so that we had to be larger than life so that we could attract your attention and then we could bombard you either with our art or with what we had to say. So that's why we look like this because we wanted you to first take notice of us and then we could force our art on you. <laughs> uh, the other thing we were really good at, to get Chicanos to come and look at work, we would say, we're going to have a party. <laughs> 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 
with music and you know whatever and everybody go and so he'd send out all the these in you know flyers or I don't know I don't yeah invites or whatever so we'd get all of you there and then you'd come really you were coming to an art show and our art exhibits actually started to become quite the thing pretty popular so that was cool And then on Whittier Boulevard, I'll go a little bit, I'm going a little back and forth. There was this recruiting station. And we used to look at that place and we were pretty upset about it. So what happened is that after the riots, we used to have a Christmas parade. And uh, the Christmas parade was no longer going to happen. You know, nobody wanted to uh, invest in a parade any longer. So we talked about it, and then we thought, let's bring the parade to the, back to the people. <coughs> so we decided we were going to meet on a particular day at a particular time during the holidays. We actually didn't talk about what we were going to come dressed as, so we just, uh, so on that day, I wasn't feeling very good. I was not feeling well. I was a little under the weather a bit. So I'm going, oh, God, I don't want to have to get up, even though my costume was there hanging on the door. And I lived in the back house, and there's like a long drive. Uh, not drive, but you had to walk through like a walkway to get to the back house. So my mom goes, Miha, Gronk's here. Gronk's coming down the path or something. She goes, you better get up. So I go and I peek out and oh my God, there's, I mean, come on. There's Gronk is a living Christmas tree. And as he walked, the chiffon bounced with those big balls on the end and that star. I'm like, oh my God. And that was first seeing Gronk and then with those satin pants and those platforms. And then Willie shows up right behind him as sort of the Christ, kind of Christ-like figure with all these suffering images made out of uh, masonite panel and tin foil or aluminum foil. I mean, that was the other thing about, we didn't have any money, but we never let that limit us in our creativity. You know, we made art out of found material or everyday stuff. I think he even painted part of that with shoe polish. So anyway, that perked me up real quick. <laughs> and I got up and got dressed. And I was ready to perform for the people. So we start, I think it was on Ford Avenue and we're gonna walk and our destination was that Marine Induction Center. Cause we had planned to leave something on their front door. And I can't remember if we did or not cause it's been a very, very long time. So uh, what was sort of hilarious is that when we're walking thinking, oh, we're bringing the parade to the people. <laughs> I could hear ladies going, Santo Nino, que es? Like, dear God, what is this? It's, they were horrified. We were scaring people. And, uh, you know, it, but that's why I knew that I couldn't make eye contact with anybody. That's why we look so serious or I'm looking down because I thought I can't make eye contact. The other thing I knew quite, I knew that I needed a bodyguard. As a woman, I felt I needed the guys, who knows, but I had to take care of myself. So, because either the cops, will, there's a short film about this mural, and you see the cops circling us. They're going around and around. So either you, were, you know, could get arrested, or who knew, some gangbanger could come, and who know what could happen. So thank God it was uh, safe and... Uh, Nothing drastic happened that day other than hearing the moans of the people. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, and I forgot, I need to quote Gronk because Gronk said, Gronk described what we did, the art making was aesthetics, the aesthetics of poverty. I thought that was a really important saying. And then OSCO, uh, we part, there, self-help graphics, it's a cultural center in East LA has, or had, or still has a Day of the Dead event. And I think this was one of the first ones in 1972. And uh, we participated in it. And then there was an art center called Mexicano. And it wasn't far from where Gronk lived, again, on Whittier, this famous Whittier Boulevard. I think it was walking distance from his house. So we're in front of the center, and I think they took a picture of us for a, a magazine. I sort of look, I look at that, and I laugh. We look like a rock group. But anyway, <laughs> um, what was ironic is that the Chicano movement is happening here, and Osco is alongside it, because we were not embraced by our own culture. We were sort of ousted because they, we looked, we didn't fit in. Uh, we weren't really understood, but we didn't really let that get in the way of what we were doing. We just continued on, on our practice. And uh, Gronk went into Mexicano with a whole bunch of either drawings or paintings he had done and wanted to do a show there. So he shows up and they said, no, that's not Chicano enough, or that doesn't. So he, you know, he's a little feisty. He went, oh, really? OK. He left. He goes home. I think the next day or that later that day, he brings the work. He piles it in front of the place, and he starts it all on fire <laughs> in protest to such a limited way of thinking. He burned his work. So again, we were real good at taking our publicity photos. <laughs> and this was for a show called, I don't know how we came up with the name, with Osco Zilla Show. And then the muralism that was going on in the neighborhood. Again, we knew it was, well, I can only speak for myself. I knew it was politically relevant. It had a message but doesn't mean I actually thought it was very good. Some of it was pretty ugly. Some of the work was really bad. So we decided, we came up with the instant mural where we took muralism to another level. So I became the art. Well, there's actually a man in the piece, too. But for some reason, he never gets shown. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, because the feminists were like, were saying, well, Patsy, why did you allow them to tape you up like that? And, uh, uh. and I'm like, well, first of all, they didn't realize that I freed myself from that wall. I, didn't, I wasn't a victim. So uh, and it took a uh, uh, I forgot his name who wrote an article for the LA Times. I mean, he got it. I mean, he said it eloquently, and I should have quoted him, but I didn't. So anyway, we're doing the instant mural. And again, as I think Harry coined it, hit and run tactics, because again, you have to remember we're in an environment where the police presence is very strong. And at any minute, we could get arrested. So we had to do things really quickly. We were there, we did it, we documented it, and then we zoomed away. That's a detail. <laughs> so here we are on Cinco de Mayo. And I came dressed as a child of the plume serpent. And Gronk is a mosaic. I remember when he said, I'm going to come as a mosaic. And I'm thinking, how can you come as a mosaic? <laughs> I didn't get it. Oh, there it is. 
There I am in my studio, which was a garage, my studio garage. And I always collected props and objects for my performances that were symbolic and meaningful to me. And I think a writer, Ramon, said that I'm in my surrealistic, I don't know, something about being in my surrealistic environment. So we also developed what you call a no movie movie. And you're probably thinking, what? What's that? <laughs> well, we, we didn't have a movie camera, so we used to make our films with stills. So we made films without celluloid. And our movies in one part were in response to being excluded from the Hollywood system. And then again, we weren't gonna wait, we were gonna just do it ourselves. That's what I tell young people. Don't wait around to be discovered, take charge. We didn't wait, Osco never waited. Like we didn't wait for a gallery or a dealer or any of that. We just found a space and had a show. And uh, eventually, I don't know who was the brainchild behind it, but the os one member of the group, I think it might have been Gronk, I'm not sure, who decided to create the Aslan Award, our, like our Grammy. So, there I am performing in front of the Department of Water, Water and Power in downtown LA and I got into their, I don't know what it was called, their fountain or whatever. <laughs> but we had, again, we saw Los Angeles is a huge set that we utilized. And the public, I mean, and then the people were already there. I mean, we already had a built-in audience. So we took advantage of that. And here we are, Billy and I, on the steps of the music center. And this is called a la mode. And this was a popular location where usually, uh, where we had coffee and meetings with different artists or with each other, you know, where we had, we hung out there quite a bit. So it became, and it's a historic uh, restaurant in downtown LA. So when it was, I think it was upstairs, there was nobody really around. So we rushed up there. We pose. I think there's even a photo of Gronk like up on the wall. I, I don't have access to that image. And uh, so we were performing our no movie movie. And uh, it's a, I, what I read. A la mode has been described as seductive play with self-transformation, camp, masquerade, and androgyny. I thought that was a really good description. And I know one thing for me, when they aimed, the, when I was in front of that camera, I remember thinking that I was gazing out at the world in sort of a dare mode, meaning I dare you, basically, yeah, I, I, that's all I'm going to say. I, oh, I remember looking out at the world through that lens. And I remember the, uh, the other thing that really used to get under my skin was the negative, the mass media, negative and limited representation of what a Chicana was all about. And I wanted to present myself as an empowered Chicana, defiant, glamorous, and in control of my own destiny. So then I'm presented with the Aslan Award. <laughs> it's so hilarious. <laughs> So here I am accepting my 
Academy Award for those street performances. And that award still exists. I think it's on display in Europe somewhere, in a, in a, in a, bo in a plexi box. OK, so people always go, well, Patsy, how come your name's not on that wall? And I'm like, yeah, let me tell you the story. <laughs> so basically, as you've seen earlier, I always wore these really high platform shoes. I mean, I wore them, I don't know, I wore them all, all the time. I was so short, so I love being tall. And that day, we were having a meeting with the guys. and. The, they, we were planning what we were going to do, and then one of the members said, but Patsy, how are you going to run in those shoes? And I'm like, oh my God. He goes, and what if we get busted? And one fear that I had was getting arrested. I was so afraid, and it was so easy to happen in those days. I'm thinking, oh my God, I never want to go to jail. So anyway, somehow I allowed myself to be convinced that it wasn't a safe thing for me to do. Well, they leave my name off the wall, and I was so pissed. The next day, I'm like, well, what happened to my name? And Harry said, oh, my God. So he, we jumped in the car the, the next morning before it got erased. And um, he documented me in front of that, the graffiti I had to stand in and be my own tag. Uh, one last thing. When we finally had the show at LACMA uh, two years ago, when the door finally opened and we were inside, is what we always wanted. I've been working with a young graffiti artist named Vile Reyes. So I don't know, I was talking to Vile. He goes, oh, I'm sorry I didn't go to your opening. He goes, but you know what I was going to do? And I said, no, Vile, what? He goes, I was going to show up and tag the wall. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> my skin, like, I, I'm like, what, Vile? And he said, I was going to go tag the wall. And I'm like, oh, my God, the door finally opened. And now it's going to slam shut again, you know. And anyway, he didn't do it. And the night... Gronk and I got invited to go talk at, the, at, at LACMA when we were finally inside. So Vial, I had a spray can that I was going to take home and spray silver. And we we're going to do like a, a, we're making a piece together. And I was driving on my way to LACMA. And then I remembered, oh my God, I have that spray can in my purse, but it was, it was empty. You could hear that little marble. And I thought, oh, I'm going to play a trick. So when we were inside and Grunk and I were talking and discussing the work, all of a sudden I had like this little bag. I opened it up. There's a curator and everyone's listening very intently. And I go, oh, Grunk, I brought something. He knew her. He goes, oh, really? What? I opened it. I got out the can and I started shaking it. The curator was horrified. She <laughs> thought I was going to tag the inside of the museum. <laughs> And then I said, don't worry, it's empty. They, security was already going to come. It was just another little OSCO tactic. <laughs> and there I am in my studio garage with my, I didn't have a camera, so I used to go into a photo booth. That's what all those little photos are. And I used to, do ch I used to change in a photo booth when they, ex I, they don't exist anymore. And I'd have a friend guard the, the, there was a curtain, so she'd stand guard, and I'd go in there and be changing and doing whatever I needed to do for that camera. So anyway, here I am with no canary. And the reason that a lot in a lot of images, I'm showing a few where you see me in cages or bound or gagged, is because... I felt very much like that at the time. I felt censored a lot as a woman. Even in, at home, mija, mija, be quiet. Or when people, I'd say something very maybe disturbing. It's like, shh, like, you know, I was always told to be quiet, shut up. 
or else when I had something to say, I always felt that I wasn't really being heard. So that's why these images. And there's Billy, Star, and myself in a still for a no move. I loved sort of what was great about art, what's great about art making or for me at the time was that I could be and do anything I chose and nobody could tell me what to do or censor me. Art, through art, I found complete freedom. And the reason I call this search and no seizure is because I was always being searched, but thank God I was never seized. You know, get out of the car, what do you have in your purse? My friend who only had birth, she was born with just uh, her arm, was uh, just up to here. Virgie was her name. We're in the car driving my little Volkswagen and the cops would pull us over, get out of the car, and then they'd say, open your bag to my friend with one arm. And I'm like, why do, you have to, why do they have to look in her bag? And they thought, well, she could have a gun in there. I'm like, yeah, right, she only has one hand and she's gonna have a gun in there. And then real quick, I'm coming to the end, close. So during the OSCO days, uh, we did a, what we called a paper fashion show. And uh, it was, I could say it was started as Grunk's idea. And he said, okay, we're going to meet on this day. And we're all going to show up and we're going to make some paper fashions. Can't use anything but paper. And that was really good because being so limited in what you, were, what you had to use, uh, it made you extremely creative. Well... We all go away and make paper fashions, and Gronk shows up with Herb wearing fabric boxer shorts. And I'm like, yeah, Gronk would do that. We're all, the, we're all the dummies that followed, and then he comes in his models wearing fabric. He's a character. Okay, and real quickly, so I'm trying to bring it up to the present. Um, now, after... 35 years, I don't even know how many years it's been. Finally, uh, LACMA gives us a show. Thank God I'm still alive <laughs> and standing. And then they ask me, can you create some paper, like revisit those years when you made paper fat costumes? And I said, well, I can reinterpret but I can never do what I, you know, copy. It's impossible and I'd be bored to death. So I took them up on their challenge. And the, but when the Oscar show went to Mexico City uh, last year, I was asked to come in, work with the young people and do a paper, not only young people, it was all, all different ages, and do a paper fashion workshop. So here's a collaborative piece, vile my graffiti artist in the back, well not mine, but the graffiti artist in the back. I, and then the students tore all the graffiti up, reconfigured it, and I made a piece that's in the back, but it, I guess I edited it out. And then what was so cool about the, the participants, this young Mexicana, she was sort of shy. And she said, Patsy, you know, they want me to take off this and, and pose with my, I guess, this bra she had on. And the guy made the costume, her, the guy who was collaborating. There was three of us. And she was all shy and nervous. I said, oh, come on, be Asco for a day. Well, look at her now. I mean, she just really went for it. And she was so Asco. So um, in 2013, October, I think, I was asked to come to Nottingham. And for the Asco show part two, this is a nut called No Movie, it's their interpretation. They asked me if I'd come and do some paper fashions. And, um, and so I went there. I stayed there a month. I worked with a British artist, young artist. I, uh, he, held, he was a great assistant, and we made these 
paper set and paper dresses. And to me, they're very sculptural because they have to stand on their own. And Nadim and I collaborated on the Black Queen. And there it is. And then on YouTube, you can see the fashion show. If you type in Nottingham Contemporary and then my name, you'll see the fashion show. And there's, uh, there it is being worn by <coughs> a Brit <coughs> with her chola hairdo. <laughs> it's all paper, cardboard, and duct tape. Then I made the Aztec Queen. <coughs> And that's sort of the similar dress from the Osco days, my reinterpretation of it. And then I made a no, it was called a no movie show, so I made my go-go dress, no movie movie, stills of Billy and I with a cardboard and price tag hat. Then I made a veed hen dress. And there they are on the catwalk. And that's it for that. <laughs> so real quickly, while we're doing the Q&A, there'll just be some of my 80s photographs that will be playing in the background. And those are on exhibit right now in Marseille, France. Actually, the opening is tomorrow in Marseille yeah okay should we just stand here right yeah oh <clears throat> I think I can do it let's see let me see if I can do it how do I do it full screen you you do the slide where it says slideshow or whatever okay are we ready yeah. I hope it's not a distraction but Actually, we might, you know, start with some of these because it, as uh, we're having a conversation, I think you'll see that the quality of the photographic uh, imagination that, uh, that Patsy brings to her work, which, as she said, ha has not been viewed very or much embraced. Uh, or embraced. And so I'm, it's, I'm yeah. glad you're bringing that up because I had planned to do an introduction and I should just say a little bit about yeah. them is that my goal early on, these are from 1980s, that yes. I wanted to show a contemporary sort of hip image, glamorous image of a Chicana and there's, and I say others. So uh, I took those, fo I was a photographer for 10 years actually, but nobody knows that part of my work. So that's why I was so happy when France said, oh, we love them, we're gonna show them. And finally, yeah. someone's actually willing to, to look and exhibit some of these pieces. But there's a lot of them, 10 years of work that have never been shown. The goal is that one day, maybe I could have it, have them published in a book or something. So, anyway. Good. More light, not less. Good. Okay. All right. Um, well, I, I, you know, once again, I'm uh, Genaro by the I teach in the uh, in the English department here, and uh, for me, this is an extraordinary event, extraordinary honor to have uh, Patsy Valdez, who is. Um, like well beyond being a, a famous Chicana artist. She is a, a world-class artist, period. Her work has appeared uh, all over the United States, her collection, or her pieces now uh, belong in the Smithsonian, in the Whitney, uh, as oh, I understand I just, it. Oh, Whitney um, just collected something before I got here. Yeah, so th these, are, these are major achievements by um, by an artist from uh, Los Angeles who many of us are now incorporating into our thinking, our, uh, our writing, our work, our uh, consideration of our uh, historical uh, place in, in this country with respect to art, uh, literature, uh, painting, photography, and the whole range of aesthetic and cultural uh, practice. Uh, so with, with that, I, I, I kind of want to pick up a conversation that we started a, a little bit yesterday. Okay. Um, 
um, there are a number of uh, instant murals uh, that you've seen here. They're, they're, they're events rather than actual painted murals on, mm -hmm. on walls. Uh, and you talked a little bit about, about the way in which uh, you conceptualize the, the instant mural as a, I guess, as a counter activity, a counter statement, a counter performance to actual what murals uh, all over the, that uh, were and still are uh, on walls all over uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco and, and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was something about those that, that, uh, that yeah. was not satisfying. Yeah, not all of them, yeah. but some of them. I think we could turn these off now so it won't be a uh, disruption. Well, basic, I think I said it in the talk, but uh, we would, I don't know, we were art snobs or what, even though none of us had even been trained. But I mean, Willie and Gronk were such magnificent muralists and painters. I mean, unbelievable hmm. that when you, looked at some of the murals that were going up in the neighborhood. They were pretty bad. So, and I guess we were a bit snobby or arrogant. I don't know. I don't even know if I should say those words, but we just thought, yuck, that's ugly. <laughs> I mean, we didn't say it out loud like I just did. <laughs> did, did those, didn't, uh, for instance, the instant mural and the walkie mural say it? in language that was provocative Anti. without having to make a statement about? Well, I guess so, because nobody, we were sort of ousted. Yeah. So maybe in that way, we were a bit rebelling against what we saw on the wall. And then, uh, you know, uh, at, at the outset, I, li I like the, the slide you show of uh, Woodstock Oh, what and, uh, and the lines from uh, Jefferson, Jefferson Airplane, Airplane from White Grace Rabbit. Slick, mm -hmm. uh, White Rabbit, mm -hmm. which is uh, yeah. about the drug uh, culture. Mm -hmm. and, and you said that you were something like a, a Chicana hippie. Uh -huh. All right, so you listen to a lot of American uh, rock music rather than, rather than Latin music. And, mm -hmm. and so and as I was thinking about that, that, that mm -hmm. fusion, that hybridity between sort of American cultural production uh, and popular popular art and, and culture and 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 more traditional uh, Mexican uh, iconography of the kind that you find in the murals uh, all over. Mm. Typically, the sort of uh, the re re reproductions mm -hmm. of La Virgen or uh, the uh, Pancho Villa or the various heroes, and then yes. uh, you know sort of a, a, his a historical choreography of, of, of ideas and images. Uh, so it, it isn't surprising that, at least to me, that mm -hmm. when uh, you took your work, say, to a Chicano gallery, it was not accepted <laughs> because it was not, uh, quote, uh, you Chicano. were not being Chicano enough. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm a little curious about, well, wh what then is or was Chicano enough? I think we'd have to ask them that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, why do we have to be limited? Why can't we just, isn't art about dreaming, be creative and creating new images, exploration? Uh, why does it have to be narrow and limited? I mean, if that's the case, and I don't want to be an artist. I mean, I was an artist so that I could have freedom. So you, so you don't want it to be limited by what some people might call identity uh, politics or, identi or identi I mean, if, identity aesthetics. Yeah, if that's what you want to make, I respect that and that's fine, but I should be able to do whatever I want. Yeah. And I was into reinvention and reinterpretation. Okay. So what does it feel like now uh, to be in the museum? I mean, that's an old, that's a kind of old problem. Finally. That, you know? <laughs> That's all I can say. I mean, when you tag, when you initially tagged the uh, Lachman, uh -huh. when you made a, once again, that was an event that was to uh, critique or repudiate, yeah, to let us in. Open but at the, the same, door. At the same time, it it is a uh, was is still is a radical uh, a, a critique of what the museum represents, which is that which keeps a lot of stuff out. It keeps well, I it keeps communities out, uh, and and it's only in the last. Uh, maybe 20 years that the museum has begun to sort of... Well, 
And I want to make a comment about that. First of all, Harry said this. I don't know how true it is or not, but he said that he met with a curator, and the curator said, well, Chicanos don't make art. They just do graffiti or something. Well, basically, uh, I think the only reason that we got in that door is because our young people are no, now going off to school. They're getting educated, and they're finally being put in positions of power, meaning mm -hmm. Rita and Andine. Rita's a curator at LACMA, and Andine did his thesis on, on, on OSCO. And if it wasn't for their interest, their research, and their writing, and now she's a curator at LACMA, mm -hmm. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that's mm -hmm. really the only way we got in. Mm -hmm. that's true. Otherwise, if they wouldn't have brought um, us to the table, I don't think anybody else ever was. I don't know, but maybe not in my lifetime. Yeah. So that's why it's so important to, for edu to get educated, and we need more curators, and we no need, need more people in power positions. Okay. Now let's go back to the, to the Chicano gallery for a minute and the Chicano oh. shows. Uh, okay. Because uh, one of the images that you showed here of the instant mural where you're taped mm -hmm. uh, to the wall, mm -hmm. you say you were not a victim, that no. you actually tore free yes. uh, from the tape and the wall. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, a, uh, that, that's, a, that's a photograph. Uh, that's, a, that's an image that has been criticized a lot, mm -hmm. uh, especially by, in, in a feminist uh, uh, critique, mm -hmm. uh, that those pictures of you being gagged and bound and mm -hmm. in a cage. Oh, yeah. Uh, were, uh, were, there's a difference between uh, something which is a, a statement on being silenced, on being censored, and representations in which uh, you are being censored and silenced and, and gagged. Mm -hmm. So I just want uh, maybe a little bit more about, uh, uh, about not being uh, a, a victim. And, and then I guess mm -hmm. the question might be, were you silenced or censored by, uh, by Harry, by Willie, by Gronk? Well, see, that was it at never. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in that group. Okay. I would have left. No, there was, at the time in the group, we were equals. I never felt, I mean, the reason I became an artist was to find my voice and for freedom. So if any time you tried to censor me, you couldn't, I wouldn't be there. Okay. I would have left. So, uh, but I need to say another thing. I needed to make art about what was going on in my life. I couldn't make art about something else. And uh, that's exactly how I was feeling. I didn't talk about my childhood and all the other stuff from the dysfunction, the, 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 the racism, the da, da 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 I could go on and on. Maybe that'll be in my book. You could buy, I'm kidding. I, I, I'm kidding. I'm, so uh, there was a lot going on that I haven't even talked about that I felt I needed to make images like that because that's exactly how I felt at the time. And that's for me what art is, my art is about. I mean, what I, I couldn't make happy, I couldn't make happy images mm -hmm. at that time. That came later. Not happy, but leave, I was starting to leave the darkness and aim for the light. Mm, cool. Uh, and then uh, I was just curious to know what kind of uh, interactions you might have had as a group or as individual artists mm -hmm. with other Chicano and Latino artists, and uh, especially in California. You know, I'm thinking of you know Judith Baca and oh. Amelia Mesa Baines, uh, Carmen Garza, not, you know, uh, Jose you know, Montoya, Malakia. I didn't Montoya. know any of them. I mean, I met Amalia years and years later, who became my mentor, but I really didn't. We were a very we were, we were in Los Angeles, didn't have a car, we were, came, worked in a garage. I remember even just going to City Terrace, I thought, where am I? Mm. I mean, that's how far I traveled from home, from here to here. Mm. So we were very, and you have to understand, I, wasn't in the, I was in the group from 1972 to 82 and then off to art school. Right. So those cup, it's a very short time that I'm with this group. And we were a very tight-knit group. 
and we were working very hard making our art images and doing what we were doing. I don't remember that much di dialogue with other artists. I really, maybe Carlos Almaraz, they took me to, who was, a, was one of our great painters who's no longer alive. I remember going to his house because that was Gronk's friend. I'm trying to think, I did meet the women like Judy Hernandez, Judy Baca, right. da da da. But again, I was different from them. I remember one time, I'm not saying they did it, but I was supposed to be on a cover of a magazine. And the, the women ousted me off, said no, she, no, no, she doesn't represent us because I wore makeup and whatever, how. So I was ousted. So I just sort of kept with the group Mm -hmm. And we did our thing. Okay. Questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you counter that? Like, mm -hmm. you know, when you would go to produce your work, there was always like that, you know, what, like, oh, God, what are you doing? Or like, what are they going to think? How did you move past that? Like, what were you trying oh. to like, push through that? You know what? I, I, when I think back, I'm stubborn as <laughs> hell. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and I really think that that, if you said, Patsy, can you, do that over there, and I'd say, no, I can do that. You know, I had this horribly stubborn as a mule attitude. <laughs> and I just had a goal and a focus that was like steel. I had a goal, and I was going to get there no matter what. My friend would even say, like, when I was going through difficult things in relationships or whatever, she'd say, how in the world do you continue to make your art in the middle of that? And I never allowed my personal life or other things to get in the way of my goals. And I just, I had like a laser vision. And that's how much I, uh, I just had that in me. And I think that's what it takes because we can get sidetracked real easy. And, uh, so it was just something intuitive and inside of me. The other thing I need to say is I also know that even in art school, even though I'd made art with Oscar and then I went to art school, I was saying that even in school, teachers didn't understand what I was doing. They weren't that supportive or they didn't, because they didn't get it. So I would just think, I had to believe in myself because if I didn't believe in myself, how could anyone else? So I had to really stay strong in my beliefs, uh, even though sometimes I felt like I was, could have been pushed off mark, but I had a strong belief in my own, in my own what I was doing. So you just have to remember, you're usually right, and you go with your in gut instincts because they're usually always right. Mm -hmm. What? Oh. Carla. Were you able to make a living from your art? That's the only way I've ever made money, through art. I've never worked as a, I've, I've survived as an art maker all these years. And you know what? I, I, I never thought about it. It's just what I've done. Uh, but I actually started making real money because I'm a painter. I mean, I'm sharing a history because that's sort of what's happening at the moment. But I'm a painter, and uh, that's how I make money. Yes? Um, what was the process like of having your art uh, in that fashion show in Europe? Mm -hmm. And um, also... Uh, I couldn't tell if one of the models was in brown face or if she had had no. her face tanned, like, uh, oh, officially. It, no. Oh, okay. So what was it like to have her? She was black. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, what was that process like? What was fantastic is that I'm asked to come to Nottingham. You know, first of all, I didn't even think Robin Hood. I'm staying on Maid Marian Way. I'm like, oh, God, then I see Robin Hood. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, a, a fake. <laughs> it was hilarious. This guy in a cape is taking us underground. Anyway, I'm following Robin Hood. So <laughs> I go to Amster, I mean, uh, Nottingham, and on the first day I meet with the young man who works at the museum who's going to be my assistant. And I didn't even know that I was going to have a studio to work in. And they, uh, he helped together. We purchased all these supplies. And then I had sketches already because I wanted to sort of, they asked me if I could recreate some of those images. So I had some ideas. I wanted to do a Veed hen. I wanted to do the Maztec queen. And I wanted to do uh, the go-go dress. But the third, the, but then I'm in England. I'm in England. I'm thinking, I have to make a queen. So working with this British artist was so fantastic because he's a man of color. He's Indian. And we just hit it off. I mean, he, I would think a thought, and he already sort of knew. Like, it, it, there was just this magic between our working relationship. And uh, it's sort of, he's a, he was a gay man. It was hilarious because he'd go, it's, he would say, <laughs> he would say, it's tea time. And I go, oh, really? And he'd come with his tray with tea, and I'm like, <laughs> He goes, isn't it great working with a gay man? I said, it's fabulous. Thank you. Not only were we peers in our working, I mean, we, we just worked well together. But he's a younger man, and he took care of me, which I really appreciated. But anyway, the experience was fantastic. And when I get on, I told him, look, Nadim, this black queen isn't just my creation. It's collaborative. So he goes, no, no, really? And I go, really? And so I wanted to share credit with him. And it was almost, I go, you have now become an honorary member of OSCO because it's collaboration. That's what OSCO was about. And it felt really great to collaborate with a young artist. So I go on stage and I'm, and uh, I, they introduce me and then we introduced Nadim. He's really shy. He didn't want to come up. But it was so great to see these two little brown people on stage, you know, that who created this fashion show. And I just felt like it was an Osco moment. And it was fantastic. Yes? I'm wondering if you can remember or if you precisely when you began to think of yourself as an artist. Because I Probably, well, I knew from elementary. And then someone said, well, how could you know that? And then when I said, I'm going to make history, I'm going to be in history books, I'm thinking, why did I think that? Anyway, I actually believe it's in my DNA. I think it's genetic because I look back now. I didn't know at the time, but when I looked back, I realized my aunt paints. My other one could have been a designer, decorator. My my two uncles were photographers. And there it is. They couldn't practice because they had to work and raise families. So I'm the fortunate one. They got to go the first college graduate of my whole family. And basically, let me tell you, I was looked at as the bad seed, in the, you know, because of the way I looked. I was judged by my parents. So uh, in the family, they thought she's the weirdo. But I'm the first college graduate. I'm very proud of that. I wish I would have gone a little further in my studies. but uh, And I believe it's genetic because at one point I hated the fact that I cared about social and political things. I was angry that I gave a damn about any of it. And I just thought, why can't I just be regular? But that was a very short moment. And then I, once I embraced it, there was no stopping me. Yes? So I was wondering if you could talk a little, about, a little bit about like the experience of working in like a collective art group, and then maybe sort of if there ever was, or like the transition into being considering yourself like an individual artist. Um, okay. 
All right. Well, I was an individual artist first, I thought. And then I met up with the guys, and then it became collaborative. What was cool about being in that group is that we were all equals, and we all had our strengths and our weaknesses. So, and let's say we're Osco and you're Osco. So what would be cool is he'd have an idea, you know, real casual. He'd say da-da-da, because we'd be, like, just hanging out, having coffee, and then I'd think, oh, and it would trigger some an idea with me, and then you'd come up with an idea, and then all of a sudden, like, we have all these props and things around. And then we just start, like, putting them on. And I'd be doing whatever, and you'd be over there. I remember one day Willie's putting mud on his face and Gronk's, I don't know what, putting a bow in his hair. I don't know. And I'm doing something else. And then Harry would set the timer on the camera, and then we had a piece. So it was very natural, very spontaneous, and it was, it was just that way in the group, you know. And then after, well, I already knew I'm an artist before, I'm an artist in this group, and then I went off to art school, which I didn't talk about. Right after, I left Osco because I wanted to go to school. And, uh, but I always just felt, <clears throat> I never, there were never any divisions. Like, I'm just an artist. I'm independent, then I'm with the group, and then I'm, and then I meet all these fabulous artists in art school that I start collaborating with. So just a natural extension of my uh, craft or whatever. So maybe okay. one more no, question. We're done? Where? Oh. OK. <laughs> Oh, how did I return to the no movies? Or I didn't really return. That's what they call the show. And they had big uh, blow up photographs of those old performances. But since it was called No Movie Movie, I just made a No Movie Movie go go dress for that particular show. And I did all that <coughs> installation work for that. You know, at some point we should have uh, Patsy mm -hmm. Valdez come back to Berkeley mm -hmm. to talk about and perhaps show her paintings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to do an Osco at uh, Berkeley Art Museum uh, and mm -hmm. get uh, some Chicana artists uh, there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the paintings are extraordinary. For those of you who have seen images of them, you can go to Patsy's uh, website. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess I would disagree uh, that, that they are troubled interior spaces. I, I, I understand too. some of that. They seem to me to be just, uh, just, uh, just mm -hmm. uh, the, the palette mm. uh, alone is so powerful. The primary colors, the kinds of uh, uh, deep oranges and forceful reds and the kind of orchestration of movement so that even uh, chairs and, 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 and beds and uh, tables take on a kind of animate uh, quality mm -hmm. uh, to them. So they seem to me to be I'm uh, glad you very much interior spaces in which a, in which a woman is saying, "This is how I imagine the space." Well, and, uh, so I'm yeah. so glad you're bringing that up, and I need to finish because because early on I've talked about my childhood that was very troubled. People tend to, you know, dark things, negative things. People tend to latch on yeah, to. Yeah. So I think that's why they equate that yeah, with that, yeah. but. In those paintings, I was trying for it started off trying to document Chicano environments. I, I don't really know how to mm -hmm. say it any differently. My, you know, and then I worked with a healer for many years, a Chinese healer. And so I became very attuned to, to energy. Mm -hmm. energy that we mm -hmm. carry, mm -hmm. energy that inanimate mm -hmm. objects carry. Mm -hmm. I just became very aware. That's why people go, ooh, it's witchcraft, it's scary. Mm -hmm. I thought, no, yeah. it's energetics. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I tried to capture in the paintings, yeah. movement, motion, energy. And I think that in the work, maybe the earlier work is darker than the new work, cause, um, but there's a fine balance between the light and the dark. I mean, you can't have light without dark, and mm -hmm. you can't have dark without light. Mm -hmm. 
So I think it's what either has been written or people's own personal stories that they put into your yeah, work. Yeah. And, uh, but it's always been a goal. After OSCO, I, instead of reach, this is it, instead of trying to save the world, like I tried in the OSCO group, you know, I started to look inside myself, make changes in here, mm. and those are more personal interiors, aiming for the light. Mm. Cool. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. This is great. Thank you.